comfortable. We have also, we can do also at home. There are several contract organizations that provide hospice care. Uh, but that usually is a decision that takes some time. So we have no problem taking a patient who looks like might need hospice care, but the decision has not yet been made. The patient comes to the ICU, we will not provide all the uh, life-sustaining care, and early on initiate a conversation with the family. Once the family or the patient agrees to be hospice care, then we will act accordingly. So to answer your question briefly, we don't use scoring system to prevent, but we initiate early on the conversation with the family, and the hospice care is approached for non-ICU care and somebody who is in the process of dying. Okay, thank you so much. We need to stop it there, sorry. So, uh, Professor uh, Matizak and Gazmuri, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, you are excused to go to your back. And Dr. Ismail, just hang on there. So, may I ask, may I ask the ch chairman conference to be here, please? You want to present him? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dr. Dr. Ali, Dr. Ali Ismail, <laughs> who just... Uh, like to thank you very much for being here with us today and for your lecture. It was really a brilliant lecture. And you've opened a very kind of interesting topic that I'm, I'm sure lots of people were uh, wondering about. So thank you very much for being here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smile and Dr. Fodery. So we're going to move on to our last topic, which is by a pharmaceutical uh, 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 lecture, and it's titled, Why Take a Risk? I'm not going to take a risk to disclose the content of this topic, so I'm going to leave it to the staff of BD Medical. Please welcome BD Medical. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here today. My name is Nermeen Rushdie. I'm a clinical consultant with BD Medical. And today we're going to have a very, very short presentation on why take a risk. And uh, I'm happy you were just saying that we don't want to take the risk. But before we move forward, what are the risks and how can we potentially help to avoid them? So when we talk about risks today, I know we've been talking about a lot of different things over the past few days. Today I'm going to talk about HAIs, hospital acquired infections, and I hope that at least one of those four are of interest to everybody in the room. I know one of them definitely is, so ventilator associated pneumonias, but unfortunately the focus for me today is going to be on bloodstream infections. So why are they a risk and why do I want to avoid them? If I look at the different causes of, of uh, bloodstream infections, central line specifically, I'll find that the majority is caused by non-tunneled CVCs. I hope that everybody in the room agrees that they are a risk and that they are a concern, and that they are a concern that we can work together in collaboration to try and minimize them or even prevent them. So what is the impact of a bloodstream infection? How does it affect my hospital and my patients, my outcomes and my results? So on crude mortality, we have anywhere between 10 and 40% with attributable mortality anywhere up to 15%, with prolongation of hospitalization up to 20%. And I've been working in this region for quite a while now, almost 15 years, and I've come to realize that in a lot of cases, you sometimes lack hospital beds when there's a patient who needs one. And I'm presuming this applies all over the world simply because I may have developed, or a patient who has acquired a hospital-acquired infection or a clapsy and are now in the hospital simply because of that and not because of the original or initi initiative causative reaction, causative cause that they were in the hospital for in the first place. Attributable costs, I understand that in a lot of cases we don't really look at that figure per se, but if you go anywhere between $34,000 and $56,000 per central line associated bloodstream infection, that is a number that I think we can hopefully agree can be spent elsewhere to better our outcomes and our results and improve on our healthcare provision, improve on our, on our patient's safety and quality of life. So preventability. About 15 years ago, um, there are two companies in the US called Medicaid and Medicare. 
They are insurance companies that provided hospitals with financial support, and their financial support poured into the hospitals where there were higher CLAPSI rates per thousand days, higher urinary tract infections, higher VAPs, higher surgical site infections. About 10 years ago, or a little later, these hospitals realized that these infections, hospital-acquired infections, were no longer inevitable. They're not inevitable. They're not a must-have. They're actually quite preventable. But for us to be able to prevent them, we need to work together toward that and agree that irrespective of where we are today, there is always going to be room for improvement on whatever our outcomes and our results are now. So can we improve? I'm hoping everyone's saying yes, we can. So moving on, one of the methodologies that has been uh, studied and evidence proven and, and gone back and forth on and confirmed by CDC, by JCI, by INS, by WHO, is that there are certain bundles that can be applied in our hospitals to standardize the kind of care we are giving our hospitals, our patients every single day. And when we standardize, we're better able to identify gaps and fill them and improve on them. So today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the CLAPSI bundles and how they can help us in our hospitals improve on the results that we have today. So one of the things I'd like to focus on is skin preparation. Before I insert my cannula, I'm going to use ultrasound or not, that's your choice or availability. I want to make sure that the area of insertion is 100% or as close to 100% clean and sterile. So I want to use a skin prep that will allow me to have a continual antimicrobial effect for up to 48 hours. I want to make sure that I use single dose flushing solutions, but that I also actually do flush my lines to prevent or minimize clotting, blockage, as well as blood reflux into my cannula or my central line, which can very potentially be a cause for microbial growth. And last but not least, I want to try and prevent one of the two major concerns that I have in terms of risks, and that is needle stick injuries and blood exposure. And those can be prevented or minimized by the use of devices that will not allow me to even use a needle. So the needle is taken out and the blood exposure is prevented or minimized. So single-use devices, as well as needle-free connectors. So my objective is to prepare, maintain, and protect. How am I going to prepare? I'm going to prepare my skin before the insertion with the CDC-recommended chlorhexidine. It appears to be a product that is, has been evidently proven to continue to give me antimicrobial effect for a 48 hour period. I'm then going to make sure that I maintain my line and by maintaining my line, I mean I'm going to look after it because the insertion of a, of, a, of a central line is not an easy task and one of the main purposes of my, of my being there, inserting that line, is to make sure that that line will continue to function, will continue to perform for as long as it possibly can without it having unfavorable outcomes. And last but not least is Two minutes, the, please. Okay, thank you. Last but not least is the protection part, which again, we talk about the chlorhexidine and the needle-free connectors, which will allow me access into my lines without having to use a needle, which will prevent or will protect both my patient and my nurse and my doctor from exposure that is 100% unnecessary. Now, having said all of that, it's also very important to mention that CDC, JCI strictly advise that irrespective of what the standardized procedures are, continuous education, monitoring, and training are very important for the success of any bundle that is put into place. And we are here today, as BD, committed to continue to be your trusted partner in healthcare in the sense that we make this commitment, this promise today, we have made it in the past and we continue to make it in the future, we're here to help with delivering to you all of the updates that are available to us, all of the new studies, all of the new guidelines that have been proven to actually move forward in terms of outcomes and results so that your collapse rates drop because zero 
is a target that is achievable. It is achievable. It's been done before, and with all due respect, if it's been done by someone, then we can do it as well. It can be done. I know it hasn't seemed that way for a while, perhaps, but it can be done. And if we believe we can do it, you believe we can do it, we're here right next to you, working with you, alongside you, to make sure that does happen. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it, and have a great day. Okay, thank you, BD Medical. So we're going to have a, a prayers break, 10 minutes. So we're back, 3.15, please. 3.15. Thank you. Uh, this is our last session in the three days conference uh, and I am sure everybody is tired by now but please uh, uh, we will continue with the more interesting cases for this uh, evening uh, our next session will be about the pre-operative management of cardiac patients uh, we will have four speakers and we will start with uh, a very interesting topic that we will all love to hear and hear again and again and again, uh, ACLS guidelines update, uh, which will be useful for all of us, uh, especially for our uh, trainees uh, and Kuwaiti board uh, resident. Um, please uh, welcome Professor uh, Gazmuri uh, 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 for the presentation. Uh, uh, already my colleagues uh, did present uh, Professor Gazmuri uh, today uh, and he is uh, practi uh, practiced his critical care medicine for two years then he traveled to the US he's currently a professor of medicine and physiology and biophysics as Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine uh, he served as a member of basic life support and advanced cardiac life support subcommittees of American Heart Association. Please uh, welcome Dr. Professor Gomez. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to discuss this bueno. topic. It's working fine now. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. What do you need? So I, I was asked to talk about um, the new guidelines for um, ACLS that were published back in 2015 and uh, address mostly the updates of these guidelines. So what I wanted to first give you a little bit of an uh, overview of what typically happens when somebody has an episode of cardiac arrest outside the hospital. And I developed that slide, I would say probably 15 years ago. And I think we have improved, but not a lot. So essentially, oh, yeah, this is, I'll try this one. So if somebody has a cardiac arrest outside the hospital, sudden cardiac arrest, usually it's VF, but at the time in which somebody um, identified the rhythm, it could be pulses, electrical activity, or a systole. So shockable rhythm have decreased in terms of the percentage down to about 30% at the moment. So what would happen if we have an effective emergency medical system is that about 30% of those individuals are going to have return of a spontaneous circulation, ROSC. That means there's a pulse. So there's no need to continue doing CPR. And this is the time in which the patient is going to be taken to a hospital. But in route, some of them are going to die from recurrent cardiac arrest. So we're now down to 25%. And getting to the hospital doesn't mean that the patient is going to survive. So ultimately, we're talking about roughly a 10% a survival. So of 100 patients, 10 of them are going to survive. That's the bad news. The good news is that most of those who survive do it with adequate neurological function and they can resume their previous activity. So plenty of opportunities to intervene. If we modify our lifestyle, we might be able to reduce the incidence of coronary artery disease, which is the main driver of sudden cardiac arrest in our population. And we we have done that, I think, successfully to some extent. We can have 
better uh, bystander CPR, better ways of providing CPR. I'm going to discuss that in a minute. And in the hospital, we can also impact the fate of these patients. Now, a brief word about what is this, what we do worldwide. There's an organization called the ILCOR. That stands for International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. And that brings many councils together. You can see there American Heart Association, Inter-American Heart Foundation, Australian Resuscitation Council. So, so it's the aggregate of all these councils um, that form ILCOR. And ILCOR will come up with recommendations uh, worldwide after reviewing the scientific evidence. That process has been done every five years. So the last one was uh, issued in 2015, before it was 2010, then 2005. From now on, it's going to be a continuous process. So every time there's new evidence that something worked for cardiac resuscitation, there's going to be a new recommendation. So the idea that we would do it every five years is no longer. It will be done based on evidence. So that's what ILCOR does, and I wanted to show you uh, this document here is called the COSTAR document. The way it works is, or it used to work, there will be a consensus on science and treat treatment recommendation for everybody. And then each council will adapt those recommendations to the local reality. So at the end, the guidelines might change a little bit from country to country based on what appeared to work better for that specific area in the world. All that from a big document that is consensus called the COSTAR document. And at the end, each council, in this case, for example, the American Heart Association is going to issue guidelines. And then we have guidelines from the European Resuscitation Council, and I'm sure you have your own guidelines and so forth. Now, if you want to read the American Heart, that is there, it's free. Uh, you can download the guidelines and you can find everything that was discussed and recommended back in 2015. So that is free of charge. Now I wanted to give you this slide here just to impact on you what happens when the heart goes into cardiac arrest. And it's, I have two slides that looks at some of the work we did in our laboratory, but I wanted to show you what happens. But you see on, on the other, on, Top there, I don't think I have a pointer here, but you see this is a peak model of cardiac arrest in which we induce uh, ventricular fibrillation. So before we induce cardiac arrest, you can see the electrocardiogram, that's a sign of rhythm. There is good blood flow through the coronary artery, that's the LAD flow. We put a probe in the left anterior descending artery, and that perfuse the heart. When the heart goes into VF, there's no longer blood flow. So I wanted you to realize that the heart still is, is consuming a lot of energy, evidenced by ventricular fibrillation. The heart is fibrillating and there's no blood flow. That creates a, a severe imbalance between oxygen demands and oxygen requirement. And that is the reason why the heart very quickly is going to develop severe ischemia. In fact, you can see here, this is what we do when we do CPR. We artificially create coronary blood flow. And the more effective CPR is, the more coronary blood flow is generated, and that increases the likelihood that we're going to be successful in reestablishing cardiac activity. Now, in this particular experiment, we measure many things directly into the myocardium because we were simulating cardiac arrest using extracorporeal circulation, ECMO. And I want to show you the myocardial lactate. Let's see, we're looking red, for example. That's a controlled animal. You can see the lactate going up to very high levels, even when we were simulating what would be conventional CPR. So the idea that CPR is going to end ischemia is not true. Ischemia persists. That's the reason why we want to resuscitate as soon as possible. And ischemia get resolved only after this return of spontaneous circulation. Now, in this particular experiment, we're using a pharmacological intervention to reduce the injury at the time of reperfusion, meaning at the time of CPR. That's the reason why in blue you see less 
uh, increase in lactate. But that's not the purpose of my talk. I just wanted you to realize when the heart is fibrillating, it creating very severe ischemia, and CPR is not enough to reverse that. We can mitigate, reduce a little bit the intensity of ischemia as we make the attempt to restore cardiac activity. Very importantly, this concept of the chain of survival is totally valid today as it was when it was first proposed. So what is important here, uh, I just want to go you very quickly. One is the recognition of the event. There's no question that witness arrest have better outcome than the unwitnessed. So time is of essence here. So the recognition of the event, activation of the emergency medical services system, um, initiate high quality CPR. That is responsibility of the bystander. Uh, as the uh, emergency service come to the place. Now because 25-30% of the victims will have VF, the most effective treatment is to deliver an electrical shock. So early defibrillation is essential and that's the reason why today we have uh, AEDs, automatic external defibrillator, in places where you expect to see an aggregate of people in the airport, airplanes, and so forth. So early defibrillation by first responder is essential. Uh, once the emergency medical system arrives with the rescue team, continue the process, high quality CPR, and take into the hospital where some interventions can be provided. Basically, uh, the ability to take the patient to the cat lab if there is suspicion of an acute myocardial infarction has been shown to improve outcome. There's discussion about hypothermia. I'm going to address that in a minute. And it's very important the patient be treated in a place in which you have doctors who are dedicated and nurses who are dedicated to the care of a very critically ill patient. So if, when everything works well, we can have survival outcome up to 20 25%. And when it doesn't work, one link that doesn't work will bring that survival down dramatically. So the saying is that the chain of survival is as strong as its weakness, li weakest link is a totally valid one and give us an opportunity to know how to intervene. So what's new? One is this very interesting is the idea to engage the public more effectively in the treatment of cardiac arrest. And there's a foundation that developed the concept that you could be activated, you as a citizen, uh, using an app that you can download, can enroll yourself and make yourself available. So there's a cardiac arrest in some location in which the system is operational. You can be called to help. You can be informed there's a cardiac arrest a couple of blocks from you and that AED is in a given location so that the bystander CPR can be started as early as possible as the ambulance arrives. So that's something new that has been encouraged by the guidelines of 2015. Uh, mobile phone dispatch of layperson. In fact, that was shown already in a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine to be effective. Now, very important is to remember the relationship between survival and how soon we're able to defibrillate. I wanted to show you this data here that uh, support that concept. This was a study that was done uh, several years back by Dr. Valenzuela in the casino of Nevada. They convinced the owners of the casinos to have AEDs everywhere and because when people are gambling, they're being monitored. It was easy for security guard to identify a collapse of a person who was in the casino, and as soon as they happened, they would activate the security system to bring the AED. It turns out that if there was ventricular fibrillation, and if the person received an electrical shock within less than three minutes, survival was 74%. So I, I tell my my, my resident, that's the best place to have a cardiac arrest in a casino. And because you can be resuscitated so quickly, probably you're not going to end with any kind of brain injury. You might even wake up and continue to gamble right away. So, yeah. Um, this is what the new guidelines recommend in terms of the way to deliver a shock. I might not really spend much time here because uh, 
of time constraint, but it's important the concept that early defibrillation works. And in terms of energy, you have to go with the manufactured. There was a time in which we were very concerned about the toxicity associated with uh, energy of the defibrillator shock. That was when we use monophasic waveforms. Any uh, manufacturer today uses biphasic waveforms. And for the same level of energy, the cardiac toxicity is much less. So there's less fear of causing injury, therefore the encouragement to deliver a shock as soon as a shockable rhythm is being recognized. Now, another important concept that I want to emphasize, the idea of the bystander providing CPR, meaning chest compression. This is a, a review of the literature several years back. I think that was for 2010, actually. And there, there was a discussion whether or not to do rescue breath, mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. And what you see there in that um, red block is what happens in terms of survival when nobody does CPR. And you can see the survival is very, very low. The numbers go from, I can see here, 6 2%. But if CPR is done with or without rescue breath, survival goes up immediately. This kind of data was the data that uh, propelled the concept of, of uh, hands-only CPR, meaning that if you have somebody who is in cardiac arrest and you witness the event, especially in an adult, the presumption that that's a cardiac event primarily and there's enough oxygen for a while, so you don't need to worry about rescue breath is totally le legitimate and you can cons concentrate on doing high quality CPR. Now, if we talk about CPR, I wanted to go back to the physiology for a few minutes because I think it's very important to understand what is that way we're doing when we compress the chest. Again, the most important thing that we can do immediately is to ensure that we have a high coronary perfusion pressure because that is the determinant of cardiac resuscitation. We need to bring oxygen to the heart that is in desperate need of oxygen. So the higher the coronary perfusion pressure, the more likely it is that we are going to be able to successfully resuscitate. Now the coronary perfusion pressure during cardiac arrest occurs in between compression. Not when you press on the chest, but when you let go. When you press the chest, all the pressure goes up, so there's no gradient for coronary blood flow. So when you go down, when you let the chest re-expand. And the pressure is, like anything else, a function of flow and resistance. The flow is the one that we generate by chest compression. The resistance is the one that we can enhance when we give a vasopressor agent. So we need to concentrate on good CPR. And the basic for good CPR, now we, oh, that got distorted. I wanted to show you the optimal depth that has been, I think, fairly established based on data in the literature between five and six centimeters. Now, how do we assess that? Uh, I don't know. Don't ask me that question, but, but that's what you have to do. Um, I'm going to tell you that, the, so depth generate flow, and flow will manifest into coronary perfusion pressure. And the higher the coronary perfusion pressure, the more likely the person is going to be successfully resuscitated. So this is the data that was published back in 1990 by Dr. Paradis showing, this is a patient who had out of hospital cardiac arrest. They were unable to resuscitate, were brought to the emergency department, they put lines and they measured the coronary perfusion pressure. You can see that the coronary perfusion pressure needed to be more than 15 millimeters of mercury for resuscitation to occur. So again, emphasizing that it's true, we need to maintain a good coronary perfusion pressure. So what does it mean high quality CPR that would lead to that? Essentially means good depth of compression between five and six centimeters, a rate between 100 and 120. Avoid leaning, you need to let the, the chest fully re-expand. If you lean there, you're going to restrict venous return. If the pause should be, for breathing should be less than 10 seconds, and the moment you establish an airway, we make it very simple. You deliver one breath every six seconds, meaning 10 breaths per minute. And we can discuss the rationale for that at any time. It's important to avoid pauses. 
so that the time that we're doing the compression should be at least 60% of the time. Uh, we don't want to go in sequence, we want to bring the team and do what's called a choreographic approach. Now, because of time, I'm going to tell you some certain things. If we have an arterial line, monitor the coronary perfusion pressure. You want to have an aortic diastolic pressure of at least 25 millimeters of mercury uh, to secure. And if we have a line, that's the way to monitor and decide when to give a vasopressor agent. End tidal CO2 is very important because it will tell you about flow. End tidal CO2 essentially is a function of CO2 production, CO2 transport, dead space ventilation, and ventilation. So if everything is constant, the, during CPR, the amount of end tidal CO2 becomes a function of the cardiac output being generated. The higher the end tidal CO2, the higher the likelihood of resuscitation. So you can look at that. If it's very low, it will help you to make the decision when to stop performing CPR. The other importance of camnography is that it will tell you that the endotracheal tube is in the trachea, and that is the most reliable way of ensuring the tube ends in the trachea and stays there during transport. So very strongly recommended that we use camnography to monitor um, the uh, proper placement of endotracheal tube. Vasopressor, this is simple. The only vasopressor agent remaining alive is epinephrine. Even vasopressin was kicked out. And vas epinephrine, I tell you, is in life support because it's true that may increase rust, but there's no evidence that survival is improved. So epinephrine, and we don't know for how long. Antiarrhythmic for shock refractory VF and VT. You can use lidocaine if you want to. There's new studies showing no big difference between amiodarone or lidocaine. Mechanical compression, we covered that, I think, earlier for the talk about the LUCA3. All what was said is a valid point. It gives you stability, consistency. You can take the patient in an ambulance and even take it to the cat lab with uh, a device. So I think devices are good. We have talked about extracorporeal circulation. It's a great way of maintaining circulation. And in patients who have not been successfully resuscitated, may have a chance through extracorporeal circulation. So I think it's a good uh, option to have. Uh, taken to the cat lab for people who have a coronary uh, occlusion, also improves survival. And in terms of hypothermia, the whole concept, I think, has been revised because there's no difference between 33 and 36 degrees centigrade. So the effort has been moved. We don't call it hypothermia anymore. We call it targeted temperature management. And you choose any number, but stick to that and avoid hyperthermia. We believe that hyperthermia is detrimental, so we need to avoid that. One more comment, prognostication. Let's give yourself time. You don't want to negatively prognosticate before three days of a patient is, that has recovered the body temperature. We tend to remove uh, support early on. I just learned that that will not happen here in Kuwait. Family will want you to keep. So it's better to delay the neuroprognostication for at least uh, three days before uh, of, uh, after the cardiac arrest and after the body temperature has uh, returned to normal. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to give you the summary. Very important to have the concept of chain of survival, engage the community. We need to increase the, the uh, percentage of patients who receive bystander CPR. AED is very important. Today, too few big victims receive bystander CPR. We have to increase that. Promote high quality CPR, very important. Uh, the devices, uh, feedback and train people to perform high quality CPR. And the post uh, care is very important. In a good ICU, you're going to be managing the temperature somehow, making a decision whether or not to take the patient to the cat lab early on. And of course, care of everything that needs to be cared for a patient who is critically ill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gazmuri, for the uh, short and informative presentation. Uh, do we take question now or after? After, okay. Uh, 
Uh, our next topic will be uh, another interesting topic, pacemakers and perioperative arrhythmias. Uh, welcome Dr. Ali Sayeq, uh, our uh, cardiologist. Uh, uh, Dr. Ali is a consultant cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist working at Chest Disease Hospital. I think everybody in Kuwait knows uh, Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali is a, gra a graduate of Kuwait University. Uh, he obtained his uh, American and Canadian Board of Internal Medicine and Adult Cardiology in Canada. He finished his fellowship in cardiac electrophysiology on Ottawa and uh, plenty of uh, publications in the field of internal medicine and cardiology. Uh, his major interest in interventional electrophysiology, both devices implantation and arrhythmias, ablation. We all know whenever there is a pacemaker or ablation, we go for uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ali. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Usman, for the nice introduction. I would like, uh, first of all, to thank the uh, coordinating committee for inviting me for this talk. And uh, anesthetists are my friends, and I always work with them in my hospital, in another hospital. I get a lot of phone calls about our patient. Uh, so I think it's time for me to pay back for their great job. And I would like to touch base on some of the issues that is a little bit, uh, sh is a sharing between us as an EP doctor and uh, my colleague, the anesthetist. Uh, these are the, uh, the main uh, areas where I'm, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about post-operative atrial fibrillation, uh, how to manage and identify the patient at a high risk. A little bit I will talk about the oral anticoagulant, especially the newer generation uh, oral anticoagulant uh, coagulant to use uh, uh, post-intensive care uh, uh, cases or even how to deal with them when you encounter them in the emergency room or after trauma or after whatsoever. Then I will talk about some of the newer uh, agent for termination of AF, uh, especially the one is being used for intravenous administration, which is I think fascinating and interesting for uh, the setup of the ICU. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about patient, uh, special patient with devices, pacemaker and implantable defibrillator and how to deal with them in case if they are going to the OR and what need to be done and one not, not think not to be done about it and not to worry about it, which is, I think, the main message I'm going to send to my colleague today. Uh, so for the post-operative atrial fibrillation, is a challenging issue. We see it every day, especially if you're working in a cardiac center. Uh, if you look at the post-cabbage complication that is seen, you compare to anything else, atrial fibrillation is the commonest post-operative problem you're going to deal with, especially in the cardiac center and even in other thoracic surgeries such as esophageal and, uh, and lung resection surgeries. So up to 30% of patients going for cabbage, they will develop atrial fibrillation. These are the patients who never had atrial fibrillation before. If they are going for valve surgery, the, the rate will go higher, 40%. If they're going to go for combined cabbage and valve, then the, the, almost 50% of the patient will develop atrial fibrillation. Uh, risk factor for atrial fibrillation. These, the risk factor actually divided into three groups. There are a, a preoperative risk factor, there is an intraoperative risk factor, and there are a postoperative risk, risk factor. So the, pre, the preoperative one are like the age, age more than 60 is uh, the, the, the strongest predictor of developing atrial fibrillation post-op. Then there are other factors such as uh, enlargement of the late left atrium, left ventricular hypertrophy, hypertension, diabetes, and, and, and others. Uh, you look at the intraoperative one is, is the, the manipulating of the heart, uh, playing around with the, with the myocardial tissue, injuring uh, the atrium or uh, the, the pericardium aggressively can predispose the patient to have more chances of atrial fibrillation. There's a question mark about off-pump, in-pump. I think the, the data is not yet clear because we still see a lot of post-operative atrial fibrillation in patients going for off-pump uh, bypass surgery. So I don't think on-off-pump on is a major uh, predictor. That's from my 
feeling, but there are some few data suggest that if you go off pump, there is less ch ch chance of having post op uh, atrial fibrillation. Post operatively also very important, uh, like uh, flooding the patient, making the patient fluid overloaded, uh, a lot of uh, catheter touching inside the heart sometime I've seen long venous catheter going to the right atrium and causing extrasystole and then predispose the patient uh, to atrial fibrillation. And in general, uh, post-operative inflammation from any source can put the patient at a higher risk of uh, post-operative atrial fibrillation. So if you look at the list, uh, risk factor, the one we can uh, deal with or we can watch for actually are things like uh, age, uh, left atrial uh, uh, size, uh, and then uh, the, the other one is basically uh, minimum. But I think uh, the two main factors are, are elderly population and patient with structural heart disease are the, the one we should pay an attention for. There are many scores uh, being validated in the literature, and the higher the score, the higher the chance uh, of your uh, atrial fibrillation occurrence uh, post-operatively. If you look at the timing of a post-operative atrial fibrillation, this slide shows you in, 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 a, in a patient with going for cardiac surgery versus patient who is going for non-cardiac surgery. For cardiac surgery, it tends to occur a little bit later in day two and continue to occur up to day six, while in a non-cardiac surgery such as esophageal surgery and lung resections uh, tend to occur earlier in the first 24 hours and usually resolve uh, quickly after, uh, afterward. And there is a strong correlation, uh, this is a very nice uh, paper I, uh, I, I took this slide from, uh, show you the correlation between the non-cardiac surgery occurrence of atrial fibrillation and the level of the inflammatory markers and they are using here C-reactive protein. As the C-reactive protein going higher, the chance of atrial fibrillation occurs more. So it's basically there is an inflammatory process goes on, triggered by the pericardiotomy and incision in the heart and fiddling around with the heart that will predispose the patient for post-operative AF. So what is exactly causing it? I'm, I'm sure all of us feel and believe that the, the inflammatory markers as well as the high catecholamine surge that is associated with the procedure and controlling the pain and et cetera post-operatively. Uh, there are a lot of uh, publication and data. I don't want to bother you about the detail. This is just a small uh, table show you the detail. Of, of many data looking at the aspect of mechanism, uh, treatment, prevention, and et cetera, and how to deal with post-operative. But I will uh, pinpoint some of the important issues that we can use, especially in the setup of the ICUs in Kuwait, because I'm sure every, every uh, country, they have different protocol and different availability of procedure and medication that make the management is a little bit different from here or, or there. Uh, but in general, you should appreciate uh, uh, the, the problem, you should understand it, and you should have a strategy in how to deal with it in order to min minimize the complication that might be associated with the post-operative AF, uh, in particular, the length of stay in the hospital and other complications such as cardiovascular uh, event, uh, stroke, uh, uh, putting the patient in heart failure, and even sometimes affect the mortality and the prognosis of the patient. These are uh, some uh, summary of some intervention that might prevent atrial fibrillation occurrence. Uh, and these are the one that is proven uh, to be statistically significant uh, and, uh, and approved based on evidence-based uh, literature in a widely uh, studied uh, uh, publication. Uh, in particular, I don't have a pointer. I think uh, the one in the bottom are the, the strongest, is, uh, and we use it a lot here in Kuwait. Uh, beta blocker is, is a very important uh, medication. Uh, we do believe that it is effective in preventing atrial fibrillation. In particular, if the patient already in it, uh, it is important to maintain it perioperatively and to reinstitute it as soon as possible after the patient 
having her surgery, his surgery and try to avoid withholding the beta blocker uh, because I know many of our intensivists tend to believe that beta blocker will aggravate the bronchospasm and they tend to hold the beta blocker and that is probably a reason why we see more uh, of atrial fibrillation postoperatively. There is actually no strong data support the initiation of beta blocker if the patient is not already in beta blocker. So I think the story of beta blocker is to maintain it if the patient already in it, try not to hold it and to start it as soon as possible. Uh, how about active drug we can introduce pre-op early on or post-op just in the day of transferring to the ICU? There are some good data on using amiodarone uh, in particular and also some data in using cetylol orally uh, before the surgery. Of course, uh, uh, cetylol has some issue of a proarrhythmia, so, but if you select your patient who have good uh, heart, good ventricle, some pediatric cases, some young patients who are going for sur uh, valve surgeries or whatever congenital surgery, they are a good candidate to be on such, uh, such a drug. But in particular, I will uh, spend some time talking about, uh, about amiodarone because I think amiodarone is a drug that suits most of our elderly patient, sorry, I'm going backward, uh, elderly patient who are going for, uh, for cardiac surgery because it has the least proarrhythmic effect and uh, also uh, it's been well validated, sorry for that, well validated in uh, this uh, important uh, Canadian trial, which is called the Papa Bear trial. This is a study where basically they introduce amiodarone orally before uh, the surgery, like we can see the patient in the anesthesia clinic before their elective uh, open heart surgery and start them in amiodarone uh, in a dose around uh, one, uh, sorry, sorry, two to three tablets a day. Uh, uh, up to six days before the surgery and of course you do that for the patient who you think their score for post-operative uh, atrial fibrillation is very high. This study actually, it's a, it's a well-designed study, it's a large study up to 600 patients where it shows that there is a statistically significant reduction in the occurrence of atrial fibrillation up to uh, 50% where it was to be 30% uh, in the placebo arm and it was 15% in the treatment arm. Uh, in the Papa Bear trial also, they look in the subgroup analysis, the higher the uh, risk for the patient to develop post-op, the, uh, the more benefit uh, you will see and the greater effect uh, of having less chances of atrial fibrillation, like the elderly patient, patient who is going for combined cabbage and uh, and valve surgery and patient with more structural heart disease. This is, if it's done in, in, in an outpatient setup, I think you will gain a lot of benefit from reducing your AF uh, uh, in the, in the uh, operating, in the, sorry, in the post-operative period. The problem with amiodarone, a lot of our colleagues, they try to use it intravenously when the patient comes after uh, the surgery and then uh, the problem will start there because IV amiodarone has a long, uh, time to work and to effectively saturate the atrial myocardium and achieve therapeutic level also intravenously has some uh, adverse effect of, uh, of hypotension and also some phlebitis and, and the patient uh, quite often not tolerating the IV amiodarone. So I think oral amiodarone is a good way to go if you think that your patient has higher chance of post-operative atrial fibrillation. So we should be bothered and concerned about uh, post-operative uh, atrial fibrillation. We should think it, we should pick up the patient who have a high risk for it in order to manage them properly, to reduce their hospital stay, to maybe also reduce the morbidity that is associated uh, with post-operative atrial fibrillation. I think the drug that is a stand up for using nowadays in Kuwait is a probably oral amiodarone uh, preoperatively cetylol in patients with normal structural heart disease and have relatively uh, some higher chances of AF. And to maintain the beta blocker that is already been uh, taken by the patient postoperatively as soon as possible. 
and to avoid uh,